going to have a few weeks of one-offs rather than doing an, another series, which we're going to do, begin a new series a bit later on, probably after Easter. And this week, yeah, please, I'm going to talk about giving. Now, giving is something we don't often talk about in this church. I think it's at least 15 years since I last spoke on, on giving of any kind. So it's not something we labor or, or major on. Uh, but it is good on, from time to time to remind us that of the principles of Scripture with regard to giving. Now, I'm going to teach what I believe Scripture says. If you don't agree with that, that's fine. Don't worry about it. You just give according to what's on your heart. Because the most important thing is that we don't give as a religious act. We give in response to what God has given to us. But nevertheless, I believe Scripture does give us some principles. And so we're going to look at, firstly, the, what the law has to say about it, what the New Testament has to say about it, and then um, I'll conclude with giving what the implications of this are for the 21st century church, and finally, where we are as a church. So we begin with the law. And essentially, as part of the law, the first five books of the Bible, the members of the community of Israel were expected to give both tithes and offerings. This is in Leviticus 27, Numbers 18, De Deuteronomy 12. And there are a number of specific instructions that surround the giving of tithes and offerings. Firstly, the tithes were the first fruits and were to be given in Jerusalem. In other words, when the first part of the harvest came, the first income of the year, it was to be taken to Jerusalem and offered up. Secondly, they were to give to God uh, his due out of the harvest before the rest of the harvest should be enjoyed. So it was the first was the offering to God in thankfulness of what he had given to them in terms of the harvest. Thirdly, the offerings or the, the tithes were used to sustain those who ministered in the house of the Lord, specifically the Levites. So the giving was given to God, but it was used to sustain those who ministered. Fourthly, the offering, offerings were given in addition to tithes. Scripture speaks of tithes and offerings. Tithes were the first 10% of that produced. Offerings were collected for specific purposes in addition to the tithe. For example, to construct the tabernacle. And offerings were also given as a free will act of worship or thanksgiving, and they were not therefore related to the harvest or to the earnings of the individuals. Offerings were in addition to the tithe. And these principles that were established in the law were also reconfirmed after the return from captivity in the book of Nehemiah, when the priesthood and the role of the Levites were both reinstituted in Nehemiah 12.44. And then we have the passage in Malachi, which says, Will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me, because, but you say, how have we robbed you? And the prophet is talking to the returned people of Israel. In tithes and offerings, you're cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows, then I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground. Nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, and you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So the complaint against the returned exiles that came through the prophet Malachi in the post-captivity period was that they were robbing God by not bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse, and thus God's house lacked food, and therefore the Levites were disappearing back and doing other jobs because they couldn't be supported. The result was that their own harvest was suffering blight and shortage. In other words, because the people weren't tithing, the house of God couldn't run properly and they were not receiving the blessing of God. The opposite of that principle is that God will bless and bring abundance for those who gave the tithe. And that's also confirmed in Ezekiel 44.30. So that's the Old Testament principles of tithing and offering. Now we turn to the New Testament. And in the New Testament, there's only one reference to tithing in the whole New Testament. 
And that's where Jesus condemned the Pharisees when he said this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, or cumin, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. In this, Jesus doesn't condemn tithing. Quite the contrary, you've practiced the latter without neglecting the former, he says. But rather, he affirms that if it's carried out as a religious practice without implying the more important issues that the law highlights, which are all about offering the grace, compassion, and justice of God, then it's of little value. He doesn't say don't tithe. He just says the mo most important thing is that we seek justice to the poor and to the needy. So Jesus says, that's the only thing Jesus says about tithing in the whole of the Gospels. So we turn to the epistles. And Paul doesn't mention tithing specifically, but this is what he does say in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 to 13. I hope you can read that. I had to squeeze it onto one slide, but I'll read it anyway. Tests how old you are and how good your eyesight is, this one. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord and, and Cephas? Or do only Barnabas and I not have the right to refrain from working? Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat the fruit of it? Or tends to a flock and does not use the milk of the flock? I'm not speaking of these things according to human judgment, am I? Or does not the law also say these things? For it's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? Or is he speaking altogether for our sake? Yes, for our sake it was written, because the plowman ought to plow in hope and the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing in the crops. And if we sowed spiritual things in you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we do not use this right, but we endure all things so that we will cause no hindrance to the gospel. Do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple, and those who attend regular at the altar have their share from the altar? What Paul affirms here is that those who preach the gospel should earn their living from the gospel. And he's not just talking about evangelizing, he's talking about those who minister amongst the people of God. He also gives the instruction in the context of affirming his own apostleship. And so what Paul is affirming here is that those who minister full time should not expect to have to earn an income from outside the church. And in this passage, he draws a direct comparison with those who serve in the temple and thus affirms the principle that just as the Levites were provided for out of the tithes of the people, so ministers in the church should also be provided for out of the giving of the people. That's essentially what he's saying. In 1 Timothy 5.17, speaking of payment to elders, he says, Elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who work hard at pre preaching and teaching. Accordingly, the church should therefore not be niggardly in paying those who lead and should pay, pay them well. He adds to this the following verse to confirm his meaning. For the scripture says she shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages. And by the way, I'm not looking for a pay rise here. I should just say that. It's always the hardest thing for any leader to speak on giving. So that was the, the Timothy scripture. And then there's one more scripture that speaks about giving, which is in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 11, which says this. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that as always, having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it's written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed for the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed to sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be enriched in everything for all liberality, 
which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. And Paul reiterates here the principle that we found in Malachi that those who give generously will receive greater blessing back from God, who will ensure that, the needs are, that all our needs are met. And he actually instructs us in that verse, in verse 7, that the literal in the Greek is give hilariously, give with a smile on your face, give in joy, give because it's fun. Not always feels like fun, does it? But that's what Paul is telling us. So how do we apply all this? The Old Testament tells us tithes and offerings. The New Testament tells us to give and to give abundantly because we will be blessed if we do. And here are some principles that I believe come out of the law of tithing that are affirmed in the New Testament and we can apply to ourselves in a New Covenant context. Firstly, we are instructed specific, not instructed specifically to tithe, but to give generously. And this should be the expression of a heart given over to God and should, should be done with a smile on our face. I believe actually the principle of scripture is God has given everything to us and everything we have is his. Everything. And we should give everything to God. And out of that heart and, 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 and uh, heart of giving, our, our offerings should flow. Secondly, when we give, the money should be used primarily to support those in ministry. Obviously, in our modern context, it also needs to be used to support other activities, to pay our rent for this hall. In the first century, they didn't have such concerns because they met in their homes. But we do have other expenses. But primarily, the more that's given, the more people can be released to serve the body and to do the mission that we're called to do. Thirdly, they were, the old, in the Old Testament, they were bought, told to bring this into the storehouse, the tithes. Um, and, the, and under the law, that storehouse was the temple, the place where God's people went up to worship. But in the New Testament, we are the temple of the living God. And our gifts should go primarily into our local storehouse to support the work of ministry amongst us. This doesn't preclude additional offerings being given elsewhere. Paul frequently refers to his own collection to alleviate the poverty of the saints in Jerusalem. And in fact, it's in this context that he affirms hilarious giving. But our primary giving should go into the local storehouse, I believe. And then fourthly, our gift isn't given to the church. Our gift is given to God. I'm not giving just to the church, although the church will receive it. I'm giving to God, and it's an offering of my heart to him in thankfulness and appropriately for all he's given to me. And this is important because we don't give primarily to support the work, although that's what it will be used for, but rather because it's what God expects of us. This means also that it's not up to us to try and control what use it's made of it, but rather to trust those who are appointed to use it appropriately. If we don't trust them with our money, how can we trust them with our spiritual well-being? Fifthly, in affirming the Malachi principle that if we give generously, God will bless us, by implication, Paul is also affirming the other Malachi principle that if we don't give, we're robbing God and this will cause a blight on our own produce. And then sixthly, the question is, are we required to give a tithe, 10%? Well, I'd say not specifically, but the principle of giving 10% is a good one to enable sufficient resource to be released to minister amongst us. I believe the emphasis, though, is on giving generously rather than a restricted or specific sum. And so we should give as much as we can. As Paul says, each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. The important thing is that our giving flows out of our heart, not just out of principle. Some would argue that the law is no longer relevant for us since Christ fulfilled the law. And so it's not appropriate to draw principles from the law and apply them in a New Testament context. But there are two ways to approach this concern. Firstly, while we're not bound by the law, that doesn't mean we ignore the law. 
Both Jesus and Paul took elements of the law and reinterpreted them for the church. And it could be argued in the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus actually pushed the bar up higher with regard to righteousness than the Levitical law. So, for example, he took the law of killing someone and applied it to even when we hate somebody. The important thing when we suggest that we're not bound by the law is not to say, uh, is to say that we're bound, not bound to keep it religiously, but we are bound to righteousness and justice. And where the law directs us towards such righteousness, we do need to listen to its principles. Secondly, tithing is found before the law in scripture in Genesis 14:20, when Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek. And so while the law clarifies and makes specific details of tithing, gives specific details of tithing as a principle, it predates the law and could therefore be said to be universally uh, applicable, regardless of the fact that the New Testament does not demand it specifically. So, we've considered here some, some general principles of tithing and offerings as they apply in the New Testament context. These are not rules to be imposed, and we would never impose them, we'd never even suggest them from a law point of view. but they are to be encouraged. However, what God looks most for is a generous heart. And where our heart is not generous, we restrict the flow of God's blessing to us and through us. In addition, as a people, we have responsibility to ensure that there is enough finance to to support the work of ministry amongst us. And there is, of course, a requirement on those who administer the finances to be good stewards of all that's received and to be open and accountable in that. However, if there is lack of resource to support the vision, then we all have responsibility in that. I'm just going to now put up a few charts of where we are financially as a church. Just hopefully this will help in our thinking. The bottom line is our accumulated income for this year. The top line is our accumulated expenses. So at the moment we are spending slightly more than we're receiving in income. That's just a general picture for the last year. And there we have the bottom line is the budgeted expenses, what we expected to spend this year, and the top line is what we've actually spent this year. And so you can see we've spent a bit more than we expected to spend. The third one here is budgeted versus actual income what we expected to receive in income and what we have received in income which matches pretty well so the income has remained stable but our expenses have gone up and then the fourth chart that's how our income has gone over the last uh, since 2016 you can see our income has gradually dropped um against budget but uh, sorry our income is the top line but our expenditure is the bottom line and generally our income has been above our expenditure but for this year for the first time our expenditure has gone above our income now why is that have we just been bad stewards of the money have we messed it up well these are the main reasons Firstly, we've made a contribution of £5,000 to support the work of CMA that Steve is doing in terms of trying to help and alleviate poverty amongst the poorest. So that's an additional contribution that we weren't expecting to make that we've made this year. Secondly, the cost of hiring this hall has gone up. And there's other expenses that have gone up, such as um, heating, and I'm sure you're all aware of that one. And then there's additional equipment that we weren't necessarily budgeting to have to replace. So that accounts for most of why we've overspent this year. But obviously, there is a limit to how much we can overspend going forward. And so this, in this last slide, the reality is we, at the moment we have good reserves, and so we're not about to get to be bankrupt as a church. That's good news. But we do have increased costs, and we all need to be aware of that. And that's not going to go away. It's only going to continue 
as uh, things bite in the years to come. But on the positive, I believe there's much more that we can do in this place, in Beverly, and we need resources to be able to do that. And so that's an encouragement for us, each one of us, to consider what we do and what we can give in order to see more released and more done out of what, who we are and what we do. And then lastly, my last point, give to God what's his due and give in to the vision of what we want to do here. Is that okay? Yeah. As I say, I'm not seeking to be heavy this morning, but from time to time, it's good to talk about these things. And if you have any questions about anything that I've just presented, see Yvonne. <laughs> 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 no, feel free to, to, to talk about the principles as well to me if you wish to. Thanks, everybody.